Okay, I think we can um, we can get started. We have some people in the audience. That's cool. Uh, so first of all, hi, and welcome to everyone to this um, talk about gender and new initiatives in gaming. It's a, a conference organized by the French Cultural Institution in the Nordics. We have participants from all the Nordic countries, uh, including France. And today, in honor of the International Women's Day 2021, we will be talking about gender representation, representation in the gaming world. Um, now, some of you might be thinking, um, it's 2021. Do we really need to have a discussion about gender in video games? Uh, do we even need initiatives? Uh, we live in the countries with the most gender equality in the world. We got to be good, right? Um, well, the truth is that this discussion is as necessary as it has ever been. We know women and non-binary people make up roughly 50% of all gamers, yet on average only 25% of the people who work in games are women or non-binary people. And in 2020, only 18% of the games announced that year had a female main character and only 3% had a non-binary main character. And that's three times as many as the year before, where only 5% of the games had a female main character. Uh, and in the world of esports, roughly, I think only like 5% of the professional esports players are women. Uh, but before we get into that very interesting subject, uh, we should get to know our participants a little bit. Um, so I'm going to start by introducing from Finland, we have Marke Kiv Kivjervi. <laughs> Hello. Uh, now by now, by your own admission, you're not a gamer. You haven't played any games since the early Nintendo days. And somehow, you ended up doing research on the video game industry. Uh, could you tell us a little bit how, that, uh, how you ended up there? Yeah, for sure. Uh, thanks, first of all, for inviting me. It's very great to take part in this uh, great panel and, and discussion. And uh, Actually, I ended up doing research in this area. I come from the field of business and organization studies, and I'm a fan of, you know, criticize, <laughs> criticizing how media touches upon business topics and, and things like that. And I've always been interested in how media, uh, media portrays women in particular. And I was very curious when I started to notice that how come does not the Finnish media touch upon the gender issue in the video game industry, because actually, of course, video games in Finland are huge as in any other country. But um, still, we know also in Finland, there are only 20% uh, women working in the industry and still somehow the media did not uh, address this issue. And I started looking into that, that why, why, what are the reasons for this? And, and then, of course, it was a popular topic, so I knew that there would be funding for this and also the, these kinds of rational motivations to get me started. Yeah. And um, uh, basically, then I just went on, and now I'm actually currently doing research, uh, also looking at how does this look for the women who work in the industry. So I interviewed women in the Finnish games industry, but also I'm doing a comparative study with uh, women in the Canadian industry to see if there are any differences. So that's something I'm doing, doing right now. I've already collected the data and some of the first drafts of them, you know, the academic papers are, are in process and, and so on. So very excited to share some findings from there today and, and to talk how these reflect back to, to the other, other countries that we have here today. And um, I was actually very interested when I noticed that we have Autrey from uh, France, and, and she's also the, um, if I understood correctly, you have been setting up the women in games in, in France. And um, the, actually the Finnish equivalent, the women in games, which is now called We in Games. So this organization, it, it was numerously cited in my own data and the, the women found that it was very relevant for them as a support mechanism. So I would like to ask you, Audrey, that um, what is your personal viewpoint into, into this idea that why do we need to have support organizations such as this to support women, women and other marginal groups in the games industry? And what are perhaps the biggest challenges 
and needs that women in, in the French context have? That is a fantastic question. Thank you so much. Um, before I try to answer that, and I don't know if we should maybe discuss it more together later on, maybe I'll, I'll introduce myself too uh, quickly, uh, or not quickly, actually. Uh, so I've been working in the game industry for 20 years, um, started as a game designer and producer for Quantic Dream and Ubisoft. And then I started my own studio 10 years ago, um, which I still run today. It's called The Game Bakers. We've just released the game uh, in December last year, so very fresh, uh, called Haven. That is one of the rare games in the industry today that is talking about uh, love and a happy and healthy relationship in games. Mm, this is not the trademark of my studio. The Game Bakers does any kind of games. We just want to make games that people will remember. So our previous game was a fighting game about freedom. But uh, it's still uh, very relevant to this conversation, especially since we have a couple as the hero of that game haven. And I will show, show you a trailer at the end of, the, of, the, of my introduction. And then after starting the Game Bakers um, and being... Uh, the head of an indie studio in, in France and then moving to Sweden and Denmark, uh, where I've been living over the last six years, um, I uh, realized that uh, what I thought, as you just said, Suzanne, was history. <laughs> Inequality in the industry was very present, still very present. So I started Women in Games France, uh, whose goal is, is really is a non-profit organization working on networking and helping women uh, who are in the industry, stay in the industry, and attract more women in the industry, and changing uh, the industry from inside so it is uh, more welcoming for women. Um, and so that's what we I've been doing since since 2017. I've been the president of the organization. We now have more than 2,000 members, and we have done a lot of uh, actions that I, I think uh, some of them relate to what you do too, so we can discuss that also together later on. And then after a few years of doing non-profit work, I also realized it wasn't enough and that the women need money to actually make the games they want to make. Because uh, as we said, there's only 15% of women who are uh, developers or creators, but you should know that there's like so few of them who also have funded a studio or funded a game or managed to raise uh, funds to, to, uh, to fund their projects. So it's uh, very, very few of those women have had the funding, and there are very few women who also give the funding. So on the finance side of things, the people who decide on what games to fund are mostly men. So this is why we created Wings. And Wings is a fund that fund games. Uh, but the games have to be uh, by diverse teams, which for us means teams with women or marginal gender developers at key positions in the team. So we've been operating that fund since uh, 2019. And we're going to announce tomorrow that we've just signed four new games. So, uh, yes, yeah, so you, uh, I can also talk a bit more about that. But then now I'm just going to show you a quick uh, trailer from uh, my last game, Haven, the launch trailer um, that was made in France. <laughs> so let me share my screen and hope everything works. Peggy, 12. You? All right. Let's talk about it. Fine. Uh, I was just going to ask if you could switch out the light. Oh. This planet is our chance to start a new life with our own rules. We can decide whatever we want. If they learn we made our way here, they probably won't be happy. What does that mean for us? That means we're in deep blue. How long do you think this is going to last? Nothing is safe, okay? That's what makes life so exciting. Do you think that failing to comply with an arrest is an aggravating charge? Yes. Good. Until the last moment, then? Until the last moment. All 
All right, I'm back. Um, I'm going to hold to your question, Marky, and I think maybe we can discuss it after everybody's done the presentation. If not, I'm just going to start speaking for so long. And I'm going to just say one thing is that Women in Games, we we have done one great initiative, which is our eSport incubator, because we have found that women in eSport were uh, also very underrepresented. And I know that is something Lily is passionate about, so I'm going to let Lily explain a little bit what she's doing. Oh, thank you so much, Audrey. So I'm Lily Kleefeld, uh, and I'm the co-founder of Female Legends, which is an e-sport initiative in Sweden at the moment. Um, it's an organization for women and non-binary uh, within e-sports. Uh, and it started with uh, me and Lisa Lind, who were working as coaches on an e-sport camp with uh, a lot of young people. Uh, and we could see on this camp that um, a lot of the non-males attending uh, had issues with confidence or they thought that they weren't as good enough and I mean we could see that that was not the issue it was something else uh, so after this camp we started what we thought was just going to be a Facebook group uh, and then that blew up and now we are uh, around 3,000 members and we do eSport camps and we have uh, government funded projects that works with inclusion uh, within eSports uh, but mostly focused on youth and um, we are uh, working as a non-profit organization uh, in Sweden and me myself I've been playing games since I was three years old so it's always been a big part of my life and um, yeah it is sad that we still need to talk about this topic uh, to this day and uh, Female Legends uh, ultimate goal is to not be needed and I mean that's what I always wanted to gender not being an issue or not being a thing in games or in esports that it could just you know people being people playing games they love uh, but i'm going to share a video that we did on dreamhack uh, which is the biggest land party in sweden um, Jag började med Sega Mega Drive, spelade mycket Sonic. Sen jag var ungefär fem år, började bygga egna datorer. Och sen har det bara fortsatt ut för, så att säga. Att bara spela och att jag kan använda hjärnan och att det inte behöver vara fysiskt, liksom. Jag har varit kronersjuk sedan jag var tio, så gaming var ett sätt för mig att skaffa vänner och att kunna göra någonting och kunna tävla i någonting och vara bra på någonting. Nästan alla barn, alltså över 90 procent av alla svenska barn, spelar spel fram till 11-12 års ålder ungefär. Då händer det någonting och då så ser vi att killar fortsätter att spela på samma höga nivå men hos tjejer så sjunker intresset. Alltså det är ju en ganska grabbig tonårsstämning om man säger så. Det händer ju att det är någon som sitter med en skärm där de visar porr. Och... Gå tillbaka till köket och liksom, jag har fått böja väl också. Det här hatet går många gånger mot deras kön istället för deras förmåga i, i spelet. Så det är ju inte alltid lätt som tjej att komma in i gamingvärlden. Så det här är ju väldigt stort stöd då, För att hitta varandra och spela med och stötta varandra. Team Legends är ett e-sport community för tjejer som spelar. Och så gör vi många aktiviteter, åker på LAN tillsammans. Vi håller i tjejturneringar, vi håller i spelkvällar. Jag har alltid velat ha en community för tjejer som man kan hitta tjejer att spela med. En gemenskap liksom, och som man vågar säga att ja, men jag är gamer. En fristad skulle jag säga. Ett sätt för tjejer att nätverka, lära känna varandra där de kan stötta varandra, peppa varandra och på det sättet växa och bli bättre. Det är ett fantastiskt arbete. De visar på att det är möjligt. De skapar en plattform för tjejer att de ska kunna växa och prata med varandra innan de tar sig ut och möter de här, den här grabbiga stämningen. Liksom. Alltså, det ser ut som ett jättebra initiativ eh, som de gör. Det handlar väldigt mycket om att få snöbollseffekten, att man börjar någonstans att det kommer fler tjejer som då kan se att det här är inget konstigt. Klart att jag kan vara här. 
vårt samarbete med Film Legends hoppas vi ge oss insikt i hur man kan jobba med att få in tjejer i en mansdominerad miljö. Det är ju inte en enkel fråga, det behövs flera förändringar. Man måste jobba mycket hårdare uppsökande för att få in tjejer. För att de finns där men de tror inte på sig själva riktigt på samma sätt som, som killar kan göra. Nu känns det som att det blir fler och fler. Men ändå fortfarande inte kö till tjejtoan så det är ändå lagom många kan man säga. All right. So uh, that's just a video that I think kind of summarizes what, 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 why we are still needed and what we do uh, to this day. So uh, I'm going to give this over to Joachim. Uh, and my question to you is, uh, what is Bioware's greatest quality and their biggest flaw when it comes to representing genders and sexuality in their games? Thank you, Lily, uh, for the question, and I'll answer that, but first give a brief uh, introduction of myself. I am Joachim. I am a senior lecturer in media studies at the University of Oslo, and I'm also a game researcher who did my PhD on the representation of gender and sexuality in Bioware's Mass Effect and Dragon Age uh, series, and I am very interested in well, that field of research, uh, how <clears throat> games represent and tell stories about uh, queerness, about women, gay people, all sorts of things that are uh, different than the stereotypical ways that games have represented um, characters and, and storylines. Uh, and I'm interested in that because I think it's it's so interesting how games have shifted uh, and changed so drastically over the course of a, a few years that I noticed that I myself, for example, uh, had really come to, to understand, like many other players have, that games, they don't really do gay content seriously, that this is not something that is included or uh, interesting. But after seeing what Bioware did, or at least attempted in different, um, different ways, opened also my eyes to, but this is also a meaningful medium to explore uh, gay identities, genders uh, in different ways uh, and also in different ways than what other media can do. And that's also what I focused on uh, in my research. Um, and currently uh, I'm planning to uh, research uh, Norwegian queer <coughs> gamers and their experiences with games and games culture. So I'll be uh, going deeper into the more Norwegian side of of things and how they uh, experience the game culture. Uh, yeah, Lily, you asked me Bioware's greatest uh, quality and greatest flaw. Uh, well, I wrote 400 pages about that, so I hope we should have an answer. It's a difficult thing uh, giving that general uh, answer to what they, uh, but I think uh, that Bioware uh, is a company that have actively learned from their past. Uh, practices and really listened to to fan feedback and tried to move uh, forward by going from, uh, let's say, for example, the Mass Effect and Dragon Age, set, which does start off a bit conservative on certain aspects, but then they try to open more gradually as they uh, release new uh, titles. So generally, the way they have, especially with Mass Effect 3 and Andromeda and uh, Dragon Age Inquisition, the way they have tried to explore different uh, gender identities, sexual identities, and practices through uh, through that, and also being able to actually try to tell stories about queerness, not just present it as an invisible or um, non-topical uh, uh, topic, but actually, for example, uh, through Dorian uh, Pavus's quest line in Dragon Age Inquisition, I really think they managed to really tell a meaningful game story about uh, being gay and the different types of uh, expectations that can be tied to you in well his position in in society i think one of the greatest flaws based on um at least my, my um analysis show is that bioware has had really different attitudes towards male and female homosexuality in their games uh whereas female homosexuality is generally treated as a topic for fascination it's talked about by many characters and it's fantasized about 
in a very straight porn way, uh, drawing on certain aspects from that. But male homosexuality is really often silent and it's talked about in more derogatory terms uh, and always as a type of problem or something that is not publicly appealing and so on. So even though uh, the general games present different romance options and seem to be equal on the, the surface, going deeper into what the games actually talk about, you really start to see that there is a very sharp dichotomy on the way, uh, for example, gayness is treated in that, uh, drawing also on stereotypical understandings and aspects um, from other media and, and culture. So I think they have done really well and, and learned a bit, but uh, they have also struggled with uh, what they think is okay to tell a player, for example, and what is okay to talk about. Okay, and thank you for, uh, for that question. And I think it's time to go over to uh, Andrea. And I am wondering, Andrea, if you could tell us what types of stories about gender and sexuality uh, are typical for Danish uh, game developers? <laughs> Thank you. Oh, wow, that's a big question. Um, as a like a game developer myself, often like I, I find myself like buried in my own game and my own story. So like to have this uh, uh, broader perspective. Mm. Yeah, I I definitely think that there is uh, more of a thought put into gender representation for sure than there is like in a global global term. But uh, I can statistically tell you like uh, how exactly like how many female or male or what sexuality they have. But uh, like I can talk a bit more about uh, our own game. Like I'm the CEO of our small indie studio that's called the Lovable, Lovable Head Cult. And we just released a game uh, last year, which has a like kind of a uh, genderless, if you can say character, it's just a circle. So we put a lot of effort into discussing and thinking about how we could make something that uh, no matter what kind of player you are, you could like mirror yourself in, in in that character and of course it's not only like to make it uh not give it a gender as us because it's a shape but it's also like how does it speak and how does it, like because it's so easy like you can so even though it's just a shape you can so easily say oh that's male that's female right like so how do we like how do I, i'm the writer too so how do i write that monologue and those dialogues so to reflect that, that that's pretty difficult um, but uh, apart from that, if I should give a little more introduction to myself, I'm sorry if I can't answer your <laughs> your question like with uh, a lot of statistical facts, but I am more sort of on the maker side than in the academia side. So apart from running a, a studio, like my background is as a writer, and that's also what I do in games. And um, then I also started two initiatives. Uh, the first one is called Game Go Workshop. And we started that already 10 years ago because at my first Nordic game co conference, which is a big conference for the Nordics for a big game event. I like, there was like, I went there, you know, it was my first conference ever. I was super excited. And there was like basically zero women. You know, it was really like, it was like pretty. It's like the most like gender intense experience I had, I guess, like in my life. And it was, yeah, it was pretty intense. So I was like, okay, so what could I do to get like more women into this industry? And not only like in the industry, but so I was, I was like, you know, like maybe you should take a step back. And like, I was thinking starting out when, when like when you're a teenager and you're like uh, interested in games and maybe game development, but there are no initiatives for you to learn. So we started the Game Go workshop where we teach uh, teenage girls how to make computer games. Uh, and we did that quite a few places in the world. We went to the Middle East, Sweden, Denmark. And uh, yeah, it's very popular. When you have this space where it's only girls, suddenly the girls feel uh, the freedom to express themselves and, uh, and make games. And then the other initiative, uh, it's called the Lust Summit. Uh, it is a symposium and a, a game jam about romance, love and sex in games. 
And uh, we started that uh, because, exactly because we wanted to have different themes, different kind of games, you know, just think about games in a different way and really explore it. And you were also a speaker at that, Joachim. And, uh, and uh, it, we did it um, in a few countries in Scandinavia, in Denmark, Finland, Norway, two times in Denmark. And uh, it, was, it was a great success, you know, really like some collaboration started, people found out they had similar interests and uh, started making games together. So yeah, that's a bit about my background and I'll just uh, show you a trailer from the game we just released that I just talked about. So I'll just uh, share my screen. So yeah, I guess that's a little bit about me. And now I, I'm going to pass it on to Susanna. And uh, this might be uh, like a bit of a, uh, like kind of a big question. So maybe we'll get like more into the discussion, but I was just, uh, thinking about, because you do like a lot of games journalism and you have kind of this broader view. And I, I was thinking, what game trends do you see coming up uh, in the future? I know it's a big question, but I was curious <laughs> when. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, <laughs> that is a big question. Uh, you're all asking big tough questions, uh, which is good. That's uh, perfect for this type of discussion. Uh, upcoming game trends. Um, it's, that's hard to say, actually, um, because there's always going to be like um, two different but parallel trends, like what's going on in AAA games and what's going on in the indie world. Uh, and the indie world is always more focused on like experimentation and, and gender and sexual identities and telling like the small sort of more uh, emotional stories, uh, whereas uh, AAA studios are more like focused on games as a service and uh, streaming services and stuff like that. Um, so uh, it's, it's a really... <laughs> <laughs> really huge question yeah. uh, that I'm not sure I'm I'm like able to answer fully. Um, it's a good question, uh, but yeah, like you said, I'm um, I work in um, in games journalism. I'm uh, I've been a games journalist for uh, it's how many years now? Nine, nine years. Um, my name is uh, Susanna Baggett, uh, for those who didn't uh, catch it. Uh, and I started working for um, Game Rector Norway, uh, became one of the very few female uh, games journalists in Norway. I think only like 7.9% of the games journalists working for a major video game website are women. Uh, and in 2017, I became quite possibly the first... Uh, but at that time, the only editor-in-chief of a major video game website, uh, which was uh, cool and also a little sad that it had to uh, happen in like 2017 and not earlier. Um, and I worked there for two years and then I decided to go 
indie. So now I'm editor in chief of a um, uh, small uh, and weird uh, game site called Spielbart, where we basically just write about whatever we want, uh, <laughs> which feels good. Um, I'm also um, a guest lecturer at uh, the University of Oslo. Um, I sometimes come into some of Joachim's classes and, uh, and give lectures about uh, gaming journalism. And I'm also a, games, uh, a guest lecturer at Høyskolen Christiania. And, um, and I sometimes give talks for uh, the Norwegian branch of, uh, of Women in Games. So that's, um, that's a little bit about me. And I'll be this uh, discussion's moderator. So I won't be like participating directly, but I'll sort of uh, hold your hands and, and guide you <laughs> uh, if you need it. But I think, uh, I think it's going to be uh, a really good dis discussion. We have so much experience here. We have so much expertise and in, like in widely different fields. Um, and, uh, and that's pretty amazing, uh, I think. Um, yeah, but so now we have gotten to know the participants um, a little. I think it's time to actually dive into the discussion itself. And you've all asked like big questions so um, that I think we can expand one during the, this discussion period. Um, and there will also be time for questions from the audience at the end of, of the discussion. Um, so hopefully we can um, shed some light on the state of the industry and why it is the way it is. Um, why are there so few women both in the games themselves and in the game industry? Uh, and what are we doing uh, to address this huge imbalance? And I know uh, most of you are uh, very hands-on, very active in the um, in the business of getting more women uh, in the industry and, and getting them the support they need. Uh, so I think I would like to start off uh, by giving the word to Audrey uh, from Women in Games uh, uh, France. Uh, you've worked in the industry for 20 years. You've worked with AAA publishers and developers and you've worked with indie. Uh, you've worked in uh, France and Sweden and China, I think. Um, so during all that time and all those places and, and all that stuff, what, what has been your main takeaway when it comes to women and marginalized genders in the industry? Why, why are there so few of us? Um, and is there a difference between like the different countries? Um, oh, my, my take on why there are so few women in the games, uh, is that we need more women in the industry. And this is why, for instance, at Women in Games, we don't work on uh, so much on representation in games, also because we are a, a, an industry-focused organization. But our goal is to change the content by changing the creators. So uh, that's how we think it's going to be a vicious cycle, uh, sorry, a virtuous cycle of diversity and equality coming uh, in the industry and then uh, leading to different types of content. Um, and I think gender is the first step and there will be many other um, inequalities to address and I hope they're also being addressed by other groups. But um, so my, my, uh, my take on why there are so few women from my culture, so I am, I am French and I lived in China and in the Nordics for the last country, for the last 15 years or something, but but uh, so I have, of course, a, maybe a different perspective from you, but I think it all comes from down to the education we give to our uh, young women and to the way of the, the, the society and the culture uh, that we are raised in. And especially uh, what encouraged me to uh, create Women in Games uh, was that I was seeing in France the statistics of uh, women working in uh, science and uh, getting uh, degrees in science was dropping, dropping those days. And I was, I was living in the illusion that women were everywhere and more and more of them were going into technical and scientific uh, career, that they would be in charge of the AI of the future, of the society of the future. But then I realized I was wrong. And um, I think the video game industry 
is part artistic and part scientific. Um, and it's a very, it makes it very special. And it also explains why we sometimes have even less women than in all the creative and cultural industries, is that uh, we don't tell little girls that they are good in math. And uh, even though they're as good as little boys, or even sometimes better and, until they graduate, then they just don't develop into those careers. And it's a very deep cultural change that needs to happen. And it has to happen. Uh, in the culture, in the society, and in the very early age of school, uh, to teaching technology and uh, changing the way we teach uh, those kids, so that we don't force on them so much of this gender stereotype that we still have in our society. Sorry, <laughs> that was my take on why we have so few uh, women in the industry. And then there are all the problems we have in any group of uh, same people, if you have a group of same people thinking the same way, they are never going to be welcoming for anyone different. It's true even for a group of women. <laughs> so the fact that video games today are made by young, white, rich, generally rich, rich class men is not helping to have diversity and it's certainly not helping women to get in, into those um, careers. Uh, so it's like, a, in that case, a vicious cycle, and it's hard to, to break. What are some of the... Ah, uh, Marke. Is it okay to continue from what Audrey said? Uh, actually, it's very interesting what you said about this uh, education and the stereotypes. I totally agree. Uh, so, for example, here in Finland, if we look at uh, at the university level, uh, at the different faculties. So I come from the business studies. So in business studies, we usually have a, an equal gender deviation. So we have 50-50 boys and girls studying business studies. Sometimes in some subjects, there are even more, more girls. Whereas if you look at the information technology faculties, then actually you only have one out of five uh, students who are women. So this clearly leads into the path that explains why we have so few women as programmers, why we have so few women in the game development jobs, because they, they, they don't have this technical education. And it was actually quite interesting because my data from Finland and from Canada, it, 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 it seems to be a universal phenomenon that all these women who work in the industry, they, they all repeat the, sort of the same story that when they were growing up, very few of them were supported to, to take on these STEM field studies uh, at school by their parents and so on. So this is one very clear explanation why we have this, this you know, um, why we don't have women in the pipeline. But um, there was another thing that you, you mentioned that what you try to do in the women in games is to um, change the, the, the ratio of men and women doing games, which is very important. But then I would say that it's not enough to bring in more women to, to design games, because what these women often actually encounter is that they are not heard. It's very difficult to introduce new uh, game characters. They constantly need to fight to, to introduce these characters. And, and I think that we need to address the, the, the sort of um, stereotyping and, and the um, um, discrimination that is going on it's sort of in the, in the cultural practices of the industry. Yeah. Uh, Lily? Yeah, so uh, I work with a lot of young girls uh, and what we see is a um, uh, severe lack of role models. Uh, a lot of the girls are not even considering that they could pursue a career in, within esports or within games. Uh, and usually we have a big meetup on DreamHack uh, and we usually try to have some kind of community lunch or dinner. And last time we had uh, some women from CETA Project Red uh, just talking to the girls and uh, explain to them how they got into the industry and uh, you know, just giving them a pep talk. Uh, and a lot of the girls were really, really moved by this. And also, I mean, we have a board uh, with, with young women that's, uh, that's leading female legends. And a lot of the people on the board were also really moved and started talking about, you know, maybe I should pursue a career within my, my, my dream game or within my dream role. 
Um, so I think a big issue is that they, the girls don't even see it as a possibility. It's not even, you know, in the picture for them. Uh, Andrea? Uh, yes, to add to both uh, Lilis and Marcus, I would say to Lilis, it's also what we did with our workshops where we teach the teenage girls how to make games, especially to have a like girls, uh, girls only space. And then also only have like uh, female teachers because that it's exactly the same thing is to create some role models that they see, okay, she's actually a game designer, or she's a programmer, she's a woman, that probably means I could do that too, right? And, uh, and to the other thing that uh, Marke talked about with the getting, and also you, Audrey, getting more uh, people into the STEM education. So I, I think it's also like, often when we do the Game Girl workshops and we go out, if we go out to a school class and ask uh, who would like to participate, a lot of the girls will say, oh, I'm not so good at math. Maybe they are, maybe they're not, you know, but, but I think also it's important to say that working in the games industry, you don't necessarily have to be a programmer there's also other roles which could be like a games writer or a project manager or it doesn't uh, like it has this reputation also of being very like uh, extremely technical and not all the roles are and a lot of the girls in the workshops are like oh cool you know I like to invent stories you know I like to do this and then you know it turns out they're really good at making music or something that unexpected you know. Yeah, so, so some of the reason why there are so few women is because, well, it's a vicious circle with lack of representation. You have a hard time picturing yourself in, a, in, in an industry where you don't see yourself, uh, which is, it's going to be hard to sort of break out of that cycle, I think. Uh, but a lot of the initiatives uh, you've mentioned and we're talking about today are doing a fantastic job. I think. Um, but what are some of the obstacles women face once they get into the industry? Um, Audrey, you talked about lack of funding, which was why you uh, started Winx. Um, why is it um, difficult to get funding if you're a woman? Or, and what are other obstacles? Uh, yeah, there's, there's quite a few face? obstacles. Unfortunately, uh, funding, it, the one that really uh, strike me the most. Um, uh, I mean, uh, there are. It's hard. It's hard to find money to make your game first. But then you realize that you're entering a room with your brand new ID and you're talking to a table of people who are going to decide, and they're only young white male. Uh, sometimes old white male. It's like just not, just no women there. No no diversity. It's very rare. Or often when you talk to women, she's usually the business developer of the publisher but not the person who's going to take the financial decision and the investment decision and so uh, it makes it even harder to come with a new idea as you said uh, i think it's mark who said that it's even harder to to come up with a new idea if no one sees the potential of your uh, new idea and all of those investment decisions because it's a video game industry because it's very creative. They're still based on guts. Lots of, of it is based on guts. Mm -hmm. no, there's not always the market research to back up your investment decision, especially when the game there is brand new, uh, or brand new ID or a different approach. So uh, that's why it's so hard. And this is why we decided to create Wings. And Wings is a fund. Uh, and the women would decide, and the people would decide, sorry, on the investment are only women. That's what makes Wings very special. This is the only fund in video games that is only um, with only deciders who are who are women, and uh, there's a lot of stories when you talk to um, developers, and one of them is Tanya X Short that you might know from Boyfriend Dungeon. And she has this great game, Boyfriend Dungeon, has a fantastic community. It's I think it was funded in like I don't know, like 24 hours on Kickstarter, and then she, yet she couldn't get investment from the publisher. They were like, what? What is this game? You date your weapons? I mean, they were, they were. And, and they didn't get it. And um, yet it was funded in like a very, very short time on Kickstarter. And it's going to be, and it's already, even if it's not out, it's already an indie success because everybody's expecting it so much. So um, that's why we started doing That's one of the reasons is the funding. And I say the rest of the reason is more mostly related to the fact that when you enter a team that is not diverse, uh, and you are the, the odd one out, you always have a lot more trouble getting your voice heard. 
Um, and that's, that's unfortunately very true for every woman in the game industry. And I also totally agree with everything you said about role models. Um, and this is why we are uh, at, at Women in Games always pushing the women forward at every occasion that people are talking about video games, we want a woman. We don't actually want panels about diversity and equality anymore. We want a woman on every panel, the tech one, the 3D one, the music one, all of them need to have women on board or, or it shouldn't, shouldn't happen. So um, yeah, we, we work on all those aspects to try to empower those women and, and encourage the women who, who hesitate to, to join the industry. But it's going gonna, it's gonna to take time to change, I agree, unfortunately. <laughs> Uh, so does uh, what Audrey has said so far resonate with the uh, with the industries in the other countries? Um, Andrea, Lily, do you recognize some of the things she's saying about obstacles for um, for women in games? Yes, I think it's also like. Uh, what Mark has said that you found in your studies that uh, some things are quite similar in, even in Canada and Finland and I think the, the obstacles are are the same like Audrey said like if you're the, the only woman then like it's really hard to get uh, your voice through and get your message through and and also I think uh, like it's looking at the industry it doesn't really seem so inviting like i mean like uh, if it's only a white man you know at a certain age talking about certain things and maybe it's really hard to see yourself applying for a job at, at one of those companies you know so yeah for sure but i also agree with the, the fact that it's we we're talking about the industry but that also as audrey like touched upon that it's also really uh really a societal question right like of how we we raise our kids and uh, how we encourage them and what role models are out there so it's it's a it's a lot to work on yeah i guess it yeah Lily. yeah and so, so what we've seen uh and in, in both studies and uh, when we've been talking with, with the girls is that uh, there is not one one issue. Usually, I get the question: It's like, why why are there so few women in esports? Why there's a few people, uh, girls? If they wanted to work within games, they they should just work within games. Um, and the answer is not not easy, and it's not one answer. Uh, it's like uh, just uphill uh, everywhere. So, for instance, there's a study showing that. Uh, families let their boys play 35 minutes more than their daughters uh, every day. Uh, so we have, you know, the pressure from home. And then also you could see in the same study that uh, girls were supposed to do uh, more stuff. They were supposed to put more time into uh, schoolwork. They were supposed to put more time into hanging out with friends and to do side activities uh, where guys were more left to do whatever they, they felt like. Uh, and I, if I talk about my own experience, it was like nobody cared that I played a lot of games when, when I was younger. And then suddenly, when I think it was like around 12, 12 or 11 years old, then suddenly I became a UFO. And it was really weird that I spent so much time in front of the computer and I had to constantly defend myself. And somewhere there, it just turned really weird on, on all aspects, both in school and with friends and with family and other grown ups. Um, so uh, I think that we need to attack the problem from multiple directions. And I also think that the core issue is the same. Uh, it starts with girls not allowed to have the controller when, when, when you play, you know, uh, two games. And then it, it ends with girls not being picked for a position within the gaming industry. Um, and another thing that... Uh, that you guys mentioned before is that uh, to, to show the diversity of roles within the uh, gaming industry in esports, it's really, really important because a lot of those different roles get, get missed uh, and they don't really see the opportunity to pursue it. Marke? Uh, thank you. I totally agree with what Lily said about this being a sort of um, bundling up to multiple issues. And in my own research, I, I've tried to look at, for example, in the Finnish games industry, how this women's exclusion and being marginalized and not being able to fully participate, 
how it's sort of, it's a cycle that starts from early gaming. And for example, we all know that we, we tend to assume that boys love competitive games. Well, it starts from how we raise our kids. Boys get to be more competitive, whereas girls are being told to play nice. And then etc cetera, etc cetera. and then we talked about these issues of what kinds of educational paths girls and boys uh, select and why and then if you look at in the in, in the industry we have multiple barriers that women experience so for example we, you Audrey for example address this issue of always sitting in a table where you have only men and this leads into what we call in research it's a homosocial action uh, which is perfectly normal. It's what people do, but we need to start seeing what, it, what are the consequences. Because if all these men then mentor other younger men and they tend to promote uh, other men in, in higher positions, then it leaves, for example, in the game design, we, we don't have that many female uh, lead artists. We don't have too many female lead game designers who actually have a say. At least in some companies, you are more hierarchical than in others. So then when you start seeing that it's um, multiple issues coming together and constantly creating bar barriers for women, then at least the perspective that I try to see it is that we need to introduce these very uh, small changes. You can't sort of change all at once. So you, you, we talk about these micro resistances. One example might be, I know in Finland, a lot of the companies where there are more women working. So you try, for example, looking at your websites. Do we only show men in our websites? Should we show more women? Which is actually showing role models for female applicants. Or if we interview people for, for a job, should we actually not only have a male interviewer, but have a people from different cultural backgrounds and so on. So I, I would be interested in hearing out what kinds of um, um, these kinds of smaller resistances can you see in, in the gaming communities, in, in your own organizations, how you could actually bring in more diversity. Andrea? Uh, yes, one thing that made me think about is that I'm also part of the Copenhagen Game Collective and uh, there is at the Nordic Game Conference, there is uh, a kind of indie contest which the uh, Copenhagen Game Collective have been a part of uh, organizing the submissions and uh, making the call and like uh, looking at the games coming in to make this exhibition of like upcoming indie games. And we had a long discussion about how you actually write that call because we felt we got uh, too few submissions from uh, non-binary, from females. It was all like the same usual crowd that would send in the games. And uh, firstly, like you can state it that uh, we accept submissions from anyone and then like obviously state that. But it's also a, a, it's thinking about those things, you know, how do you write the text? Like what images do you use? Of course, like if you show more representation, then I mean, that is going to reflect the, the submissions. So if you give your, like what you do a little thought, I think it, it goes a long way. I think um, like one of the issues is also, um, you guys have talked a lot about uh, changing the content by changing the creators and a lot of the issue with representation is in the video games themselves how gender is portrayed how women in particular are portrayed um and that's um um that's more your field uh your game uh, have you seen any changes for the better in the later years on how women are portrayed in games and have we sort of gotten any better role models in the video games themselves I think, I mean, what a role model is can be a very difficult uh, question, especially when a lot of mainstream media, for example, is talking about strong female characters and what that, whatever that means, which generally often transfers to, I guess, an action heroine or, of some sort that can actually do the same things as the, the boys can, can do, which is not necessarily, you know, the, the same thing. It's what I think Anita Sarkeesian called the Miss Male syndrome, just stepping 
um, the male traits onto a female character and thus call it a day and oh, okay we have a cool female character but I think uh, at least from the uh, the mainstream and the big games I think generally uh, female main characters I think they're more sensible to creating I mean actual people uh, instead of just caricatures or background characters but I think particularly we've seen that with, I think Horizon Zero Dawn is one of my favorite examples of a more recent um, representation of at least games that also dare to actually have the woman as the main character, not just, just the option that you can choose if you don't want to play the band, but actually a story that centers around uh, Aloy and that it actually also focuses on, there are some gendered aspects because of the back to the tribal society type of uh, culture, so it actually also meaningfully engages with some gender topics, but generally it's not a hindrance. You don't hear that at every corner that you're a woman and that this is not expected of you. And also that there's not always that love story that also that women must go through in order to be uh, relevant, uh, for example, in, in that sense. But also I think you have the game Control is also a cool game uh, uh, with a very uh, defined main, main character. But of course you also see that with Last of Us Part Two with Ellie, that was also a lesbian, for example, to show a greater sense of diversity. But of course, if you would consider Ellie a role model, that is a different type of uh, aspect, depending on what you think of the story in the game. But still, it is uh, an example of a game that actually takes a dare and actually goes against many of those warnings about, oh no, it won't sell if your main character is a woman. Uh, and hopefully those types of games also prove that that doesn't really do anything bad for your game. And if anything, it actually invites more people uh, into, into your game, thinking that this is also something for me and this is something that I want to uh, or feel welcome in. And of course, if you lose those few hundred haters who hate women and whatever, uh, I think that's a loss that you can and should take as a developer and instead uh, welcome other uh, people into, into that. Uh, but still, I, I think uh, games are slow, and I don't know why that is still a problem. I think many are, are scared. For example, back in the day when they uh, were launching uh, the first Tomb Raider game, there were a lot of concerns about, okay, would the presumed male players find this a cool character? How can we make sure that it's not too girly or whatever, uh, where they solve that by of course the physical appearance but also thinking that since she can do the same things as a male action hero would do that will probably then fix the issue of not having having that uh but then you also see uh games for example like the bayonetta games where they really exaggerate certain things and play with that feminine to to a very far extent to show that even girly girly can also be uh, very sexual and very uh, playful and also uh, controversial and confronting towards established uh, ideals. So generally, I think we are on uh, a better path, but still, uh, I think a lot of developers struggle with telling a meaningful uh, story without going through that same, oh, a woman, you have to meet stereotypes and break them and prove to the society in the game that you can do that still, even if you're a woman. Some of the Bioware games, for example, had some undertones of, of that, but generally also stayed quite uh, neutral. Uh, Lily? I also think that it's important, uh, a bit like you were talking about joking, that uh, the, the women that are role models does not need to be perfect or they do not need to be you know, the classic stereotypes, because a lot of the, when women are portraying, portrayed in games, they are the same kind of character. Uh, and I also know that a lot of uh, women feel a lot of pressure uh, within, within gaming. And I think it's also good to, to show that you do not need to be perfect. Um, I think that is um, really important. And I guess... That can refer back to the male characters as well, instead of always that being perfect, try to show men as more vulnerable, as more emotional type of characters as well, not always the unfazed, unaffected ones, uh, but still try to actually also tell meaningful stories, especially in these days when we are getting, giving more attention to men's uh, mental health, for example, and uh, that fear of showing emotion and weakness that we also need to overcome. And I think games can, can do a lot in telling meaningful uh, stories uh, there. And I think I would also like to, uh, to just take up Celeste, the platformer game, as a good example of meaningful stories and also the way that that game uh, has 
progressed, you know, uh, Madeline's character that she is a, a trans person, but that is not actively communicated in the game. It's confirmed by the developers, but it's also connected to the developers' exploration of their own identity. Uh, but still, they present the, the struggles as a more uh, general uh, struggle, uh, which is not tied specifically to gender identity, for example, but it's still something that more people can relate to. And thus also these types of stories can uh, can help more people connect to uh, queer people and other people's uh, issues uh, without making it a token trouble, for example. Uh, so games can do that. Even in a uh, difficult platform game like Celeste, you can also include a meaningful and interesting uh, story that can impact a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, it's a really good game. Um, and Audrey and Andrea, you both have made games that um, are about, uh, I wouldn't want to call it more feminine issues, uh, or actually, Andrea, in your case, I would call it more feminine issues because you've made a game about um, uh, the menstrual cycle. Ah, yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, so you talked, uh, talked about the one we just released. I was like, mm, no, but yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what, what is your sort of thought behind making games like that? And how have um, these kinds of games been received by, by your audience? Uh, I mean, with the, the Moon Tide Traveler about the female cycle, it was... Uh, I was like, when I got like into games, I was like just so fascinated by this like medium, like as I created this medium where you actually like can interact, you know, compared to like other forms of like cultural outlet where it's very like one-sided, like music or film. So I was like, oh my God, there's so much you can do with this. And I was super excited. And then I was like, but why are we like only talking about the same kind of things? Like, can we talk about something like completely uh, new or different? And that's why uh, we came up with the like, idea for the talking about the female cycle, because we thought it would be like a cool way to like kind of talk about something uh, that is like kind of concerns all women, but that still like nobody really talks about a lot and, uh, and convey it sort of in a metaphorical and abstract way. And uh, yeah, so it, I mean, like, I guess, like, what happened to us, like, and me as a creator was that we did these things that are sort of very niche still, and then moved a bit more onto the game. We just released that a bit more commercial because it's like, okay, we also actually need to release something that, like, will generate some sort of income at one point. So it can't just be, uh, you know, all these, like, small experiments, but uh, it's, it's definitely been like an interesting process. And we also released a game about the, uh, the female orgasm uh, called La Petite More, which was also, which is also, it's only pixels, 20 by 30 pixels. So you don't really, um, you know, see anything like up close or pornographic, but it still got banned on Apple. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that gave us some like uh, press, I guess. So that was that, but yeah, I mean, it, you, the, the general thing that happens is that people are very excited and it seems uh, very interested because it's something different, but that's also a bit like where it stops because it becomes too kind of controversial or people don't really know what to do with it. And especially like Audrey's talking about this group of like uh, white men that are sitting there and being a bit like, what are we going to do with this? You know, I can't relate. And then it's, oh, well, no. So, yeah, but still, like, on a positive note, I feel like games right now is such a cool and interesting field to be part of because a lot of things are happening. And, like, just being on this panel, like, when I got invited, I was so excited because 10 years ago, like, by a more, like, established institute, like the French Cultural Institute, that would never have happened. You know, not like on gender and new initiatives and games. And it was just like, okay, so things did, some things did happen. You know, it's not exactly at the same place, even though we have a long way to go still. Yeah, and maybe to compliment a bit what Andrea's saying also, because the, the, the video game medium is very young. <laughs> we, we are still learning to walk uh, almost, right? And we are a very different medium that has to have these stories and universes and settings and characters, but also the gameplay that works with it and makes a consistent, consistent experience that reinforces itself. So 
So in, in the gameplay, is very innovative gameplay is very hard to find. It's very difficult to find. And so sometimes we're just trying to stick interesting stories and characters on top of very specific gameplays and they don't always match so well and and this is why you have sometimes strange uh, feet women on very action games and you think yeah well why um, and, and we've tried at game because with our last game we've tried to make a game about a love story and you reinvent a gameplay uh, that was still a gamer's gameplay not so not an art game it's a it's a gamer's game it's a gameplay game first and it was very hard. Um, and, I, and I think there are a lot of things that are going to come when we're going to let new creators innovate and bring new ideas of gameplay that are completely different and can lead to different stories and different characters. And we talk a lot, a lot about the care and nurture games, this whole new trend of gaming, uh, Stardew Valley or Animal Crossing or Ooblets, all of those games where you actually just have to care and nurture and and then then there you can see different characters, different storylines emerge that wouldn't have been possible. Minecraft is another example where every story and every character is almost possible. So I think we are we are growing and we're gonna see more and more of interesting stories and characters and new gameplays, but we we're a bit constrained still. We're mm. young. <laughs> uh, Lily? Uh, yeah, I've seen uh, a quite a big change. Um, uh, when I mean, uh, especially when I when I was younger, uh, if you were a gamer, if you want, wanted to identify as one, then you had to kind of leave your feminine side uh, at home, uh, and you were only allowed to to play really masculine games. Uh, and you know that there was always these kind of trials. I mean, I could talk about how, how much hours I put into CS:GO or to other you know, masculine games, but I knew as soon as I would, if, if I were to mention that I even started The Sims, then I would be totally judged and nobody would take me seriously. Uh, and I've seen a big change in that, that it's easier to be both feminine and a gamer nowadays. And also when I, when, I mean, we, we founded the community uh, and some of, some of the girls are really embracing their, their feminine side and, and our gamers as, as well. And in the beginning, I was terrified because I was so scared that nobody would take them seriously, you know. And I started to realize that I have this really big issue that, you know, I, I feel like I can never be feminine and, uh, and the game at the same time if people were to take me serious. Uh, so I think that's uh, a thing that, uh, that I have seen a big change to. And also, uh, when in making games and with rotation and characters that it, it is more okay to have uh, characters that are both feminine and, and, and cool and uh, capable of doing, doing their stuff. Um, so at least that's, that's changing uh, to the better. Yeah, that's good, uh, good to hear. And I've noticed um, the same change myself, having been a part of the not necessarily the gaming industry, but the gaming community for a long time. Um, and I, uh, yeah, what you just said really resonates with my own experiences as a gamer. Uh, but it's it's fun to see that we're getting sort of getting new heroes, we're getting new sorts of types of games that also allow uh, men not to be so uh, macho all the time, that allowed them to sort of... Um, know show some other other more emotional sides uh, which is which is good uh because yeah uh but uh, when founding uh female legends and and women in games and uh, all of those initiatives have have you or like, any of you met received like negative feedback or gotten pushback on the fact that you're making something within the gaming community solely targeted at women? Yeah, Lily. Yeah, of course. And it's also kind of like a double-edged sword, in my opinion, because, I mean, uh, what we all want is just to be for gender to be irrelevant. And suddenly we're doing this separatistic uh, focus thing, and it kind of divides people in some way. Uh, but, I mean, the way we see is, is that if we focus our resources at, uh, to empowering women, we think that that's the fastest way to get to equality. And what we've seen is 
uh, for instance, uh, if you have if you have an esports team, uh, and at maximum you have one or two girls, if we say it's a team of five or six people, and usually uh, that's the girl of the team. And if the the team wins, it's uh, even though they have a girl on the team, uh, and if they lose, it's because they have a girl on the team, uh, and that put a lot of pressure on uh, on the girl in the team. And what we did when we started to have separatistic tournaments, for instance. Uh, suddenly they could just, you know, let go of the gender role and they stopped being, you know, the girl on the team and they become, you know, a spotter or a lurker or a tank or ADC. Suddenly they could just focus on the game and, and doing what they were best at. Um, and I think one of my like, biggest things that I think is weird is usually I, I get comments like, well, the, there is no, uh, it is equal uh, on, on the gaming scene. And I say, no, no, it's not. And they say, no, but I, I, this is not needed. And I say, yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, and the guy says, uh, like, no, but I, I don't think so. And I say, like, okay, but I've been studying this and working with this for uh, how many years is it now? Uh, five, six years, you know, and being a woman playing games my whole life. Uh, so what makes, my, what makes you think that your knowledge is greater than mine in this subject? And I just get the answer, no, but I, but I, don't, I don't think it's that way. Uh, and for me, that is so weird because I would never, you know, try to, uh, you know, tell a doctor or, or, or a scientist or, uh, you know, someone specialized in an area. I wouldn't say like, oh, I don't I, I don't think that you, you, you know anything about, about the brain. No, I, I don't have that <laughs> feeling, you know, uh, but it's OK to do in this subject. And that really, uh, I really think that's weird. Yeah, I, I totally relate with what you said, Lily. Uh, we've had the same feedback always is uh, being uh, treated as a separatist group and uh, unequal and uh, sexist because we are feminist. And, and, and that's the first line. And it's, it's very, very insidious and it's not easy to work with, but at least it's obvious. But my worry is more is, is going deeper with the, the game industry and the society in general that uh, that they are saying that we are counterproductive because we are saying there are problems in the industry. Well, we should just say that there are no problems for women if we want to attract women. <laughs> so they are actually trying to keep us quiet and make uh, don't let us make too much noise so that we don't damage the reputation of the game industry, which by itself is already fighting a lot of fights, right? Uh, video games are violent, video games are bad for your kids, and da, da, da. And then if we add on top of that, that the video game industry is sexist, and it's like too much, they have so many problems already, you know, presenting this video game industry in the society, in the world, and protecting the rights of the big companies who are making a lot of money. So it's a, there's a lot of opposition on, on what we're doing at every aspect, um, and including coming from women. Of course. Uh, Marke, you have written an ar article about how women are silenced, sort of, in Finnish media when it comes to the game industry. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, I could maybe elaborate on that a bit. And um, actually, I'm not sure if I mentioned my institution in the beginning, in the introduction, but it's open access article and. Um, it might be a good read even for a non-academic. So if you search for my name and University of Uvascula, you, you might find the link. It's published in Feminist Media Studies. It, it just came out this, this January. And um, it actually really came back to, to this idea that I had that why don't we talk about gender issue? Because there clearly is a problem. And, and based on interviewing women in the industry and from what you all share here, there clearly is a problem, not only in the States, not only in Canada, but also in the Nordic countries. So why don't we talk about it? And, and we actually started comparing uh, Finnish and US media texts and how they speak about the gender issue in games. And what, what, what we found out was that in Finland, there is this tendency to silence gender and we sort of trivialize this trivialize it. So we say that it's it's a problem that takes place elsewhere. It's not in Finland. We are, we've already achieved equality and it's not a big deal. So a lot of this downplaying, downplaying taking place and also what I don't know some of you mentioned because a lot of the Finnish women maybe um, they don't like to be 
called women in games because and it's understandable because you don't want to be the token women but on the other hand if we want to address gender issues then then somebody sort of needs to be in the media and talks about talk about these issues and why how, how this was interesting is that in the united states of course this media headlines are like numerous that shout about this gender inequality and they praise all these women who work in games and who try to introduce new new game characters and it's very different and i would say that one of the reasons is that in finland um and i suppose that this this applies to other nordic countries as well is because we lull into this idea that we we've already achieved equality so we don't have the tendency to talk about these issues at all it's easy to say that the problems are so much bigger elsewhere um but also i would maybe like to extend this to the other issue that i've noticed in my research and is is what you've already mentioned about this silencing so it's not only about that we think that there is no problem but actually there is this fear of what happens if we open our mouths if we speak out because of the networks a lot of the women are actually afraid of speaking out about harassment cases because then you might be kicked out of the team you might not be employed for the next job and these i mean these fears they are very real everyday fears for for these women and in this sense we have this organizational and industrial level silencing so i don't know if any of you would like to reflect on this if you have any experiences if you've talked with other women about this uh andrea uh i think you'll be uh, the last one, and then we're going to go to questions from the audience because we've actually received a lot of good questions. Uh, so go okay. ahead, Andre. Okay, I'll try to be a bit quick then. No, yeah. actually, I was in a workshop where this was uh, at the Amaze Festival in Berlin, where this was exactly the topic. Uh, how do you deal with harassment uh, in the workplace in the, if you're like hired in a bigger game company? And there was like a woman that shared a story where she had been harassed by her boss and she told the whole setup and it had been going on for a really long time. And then, of course, at the office party, it went all nuts, you know, and touching and kind of what. And she had a very uh, good uh, male colleague that was her um, a good friend that really wanted to go to HR with the story. And uh, she, like we discussed in the workshop, she just really didn't want to. Like, because she, she was really afraid of uh, like losing her job, uh, like being looked upon by the colleague as again, as the token woman that like had problems, you know, and she just didn't want to cause a fuss. And she was just, if I just ignore it, then yeah, it'll probably go away. So yeah, yeah, it's very real. It's, that's just one story. So it's, it's super real. But just like one last thing that I wanted to say before we go to the questions. And it's like, I, I watched this uh, talk and it's not, it was not games related, but it was about a representation in gender by somebody called Beverly uh, Daniel T Tatum. And, um, and what she said, and I thought, I thought a lot about it for this panel was that she said, well, we all have a network. And we, if we're in this industry, I even just study, studying this, we have a network and we have friends and we can all try to do our little part you know sometimes you can just be talking to a friend about something it can be starting like a small initiative because you know somebody and then they might talk to somebody else it doesn't like we don't need to change the world but just these small things can really have a big impact i found that very positive <laughs> thank you uh that was uh that was a great uh, comment and i have actually a question that ties directly into what we've been talking about these past few minutes and that's it's from a student in a video game school asking uh, how to deal with a classmate or co-worker who is clearly a misogynist any good advice from our panel of experts well um we have this problem in in France uh, that we need to also change the video game schools and the behavior of the students because this is where those women start their career, right? 
So there's a lot of things that have to be done on the school side and might have already been done so the, that, that, that student could see if her school has a charter or some rights or some uh, resources or some reference in the school that she could talk to already uh, to, see, uh, to seek advice. Of course, if it's, if it's just misogyny, but if there's harassment or anything, this is highly illegal and she could be held and there should be resources in her school. So uh, she she could also um, check that with uh, the the, top, the management of the school, and then my second answer is not going to help, but uh, because I I guess this student is probably working with her, so she can't just ignore him. But um, women have been spending so much time educating others that we can't actually do our job anymore, and and we can't be spending the rest of our lives educating others. Uh, so I, there's like a rule of like the you have one minute, and if you see he's not going to listen to you, just forget about it. Just remove him from your uh, environment and uh, focus your energy on what's going to make you happy and what's going to make your work shine. Um, yeah, it's a bit, bit harsh, but <laughs> not very practical advice. <laughs> Thank you, Audrey. Um, the next question um, is sort of in the same vein. Uh, do you think the Gamergate incident uh, had an impact on the evolution of gender representation in the industry and in games in the last years? Um, yeah, that's the question. Um, I'm inclined to say yes, <laughs> uh, but I would like to hear from many of you if you have any input on that uh, and uh, let me know if you need an explanation of what Gamergate is. I have an opinion on everything. It's terrible. Yeah, I, um, I, can, I can go if no one wants to go, but I think maybe there's more experts than me. I think you are Kim raised his hand. Yeah, I just wanted to just comment on that. Uh, and it has, while we can't really measure the effects it had on the industry, it's clear that it did something to expose a lot of the dirt that's not necessarily in the industry itself, but in the culture that has grown around it. And the fact that game developers and I think the large the game developers have been very careful in uh, pointing out the wrongs of their audience or the misogynist comments that many of those so-called gamers have, have had. Um, and I think there's a researcher called Andrea Braithwaite who wrote an article on that uh, discussion and what was really special about that because uh, Gamergate was, as she, as she concludes, was basically online harassment as usual, but it actually brought uh, public attention to that specific part of the game industry that's been dormant and ignored for, for so long in the public eye so that suddenly now became uh, a turning point for, for the game industry. And we've seen more and more developers, I think, be more uh, confrontational towards those attitudes and actually go out and be very specific, saying that this is something you have to deal with. And I'm referring specifically to the Battlefield 5 uh, woman on the front cover incident, which is, I think, represents one of the first times that EA or something actually just went and said, this, please learn your history. This is something that's going to happen. Uh, uh, we don't really care that you are hurt or offended by by that. So uh, I think Gamergate, if anything, has at least uh, made it clear that game developers well, can't really just let people get away with those types of comments and behavior. Um, those are not valuable customers, I would say. Thank you, uh, Joachim. Uh, Marke? Thank you. Just a really quick um, continuance from what you have said. I totally agree. And I was just thinking that what happened after Gamergate, of course, the all the uh, Me Too movements and so on, they sort of continued from there. And at least I think that there are some cross-cultural differences or country-specific differences as to what, what this led to, into. So I guess that in the Northern American contexts, these kinds of movements, they, they had a heavier impact because, of course, we had all the Riot Games and the recent Ubisoft uh, thing issue, not only in France, but also in Canada. And these sort of all created massive pressure in the Northern American context, at least for companies, they, they really had to make a change and, and respond. Um, but I think that what happened, for example, in Finland is that we tend to distance this phenomena to other countries. But however, it has created some changes here as well. 
because companies and or game game industry organizations they have established these are common codes of conduct and ethical principles ethical guidelines within the last two years and i think that it all relates to this uh, global debate that has been going on so there is wider uh, awareness that these issues need to need to be somehow systematically uh, handled thank you Merke. um that, that's a very good uh, comment i think this next question might be for you again but it might also be for everyone uh, do you think a big part of the game industry is playing it safe by sticking to making games with male protagonists because they are scared of losing their core player base or receiving negative feedback? Uh, well, yes, I guess some, that's part <laughs> of it. But uh, the game industry is also, as I guess participants also know, it's a very uh, it's a very economically hazardous industry that making money is difficult. And for publishers especially, it's all about uh, negating and minimizing risk so that with other media industries, predictability is key in order to make uh, money. And we know that from other areas of, of the media that uh, what is called pre-awareness of something that uh, you save a lot of money on advertising, for example, if you can do things or play on things that people already know. So that's why you often have sequels, because then you don't have to t teach people what this new thing is, but you can rather just play on things that are safe and just redress it in different uh, contexts. And of course, for games, that is part of it. But also, of course, since for a lo long time, that imagine of uh, 18 to 25 white male, which is actually a minority in the grander scheme of, of video game audience has been constructed and thus they have also constructed what they think this audience likes or should like and, and do in, in games. So it's, uh, I guess, both economical things, but also tradition that's easy, difficult to, to break then. Uh, Lily, you had a comment? Uh, yeah, it, we also been experienced a lot when we collaborate with big companies uh, that they are scared to be associated with us because they are afraid that they would lose their player base. And it could be a bit like, oh, we really like what you do. Here you have some stuff, but please don't tell anyone it's from us. Um, so that it's getting better, uh, but we still, we still experience that a lot. Uh, I found two questions that I would really like to answer in the, in the questions. Is that okay? Yeah, the, yeah. I'll be quick. <laughs> the first <laughs> question was, uh, if we plan to make uh, any teams with both uh, men and women and not just like a separatistic team. And of course, uh, that's, that's the, the goal. Um, and we've been, we've been trying to, to do this or we've been you know, trying to figure it out. The thing that we are scared of is if that would put too much pressure on the, the women in the team, if it would be like, yeah, half of the team has to be, to be women, for instance. Uh, and if that would make the recruitment process weird and if it would be hate directed to us, oh, but you're only in the team because they need a girl. Uh, so those are the things that we are uh, still struggling with, how to solve. Uh, and the other thing was, uh, how do you think that presence of uh, female players in uh, gaming is affecting the male, male players' behavior? And uh, definitely, I, I think like the best, <laughs> the best way would be to have 50-50 uh, guys and girls on, on the pro scene uh, with gender not being an issue. I think that would make... Uh, the best team when it comes to qualities and uh, um, and so so and those things. But uh, another thing that's that's a bit interesting is that uh, we feel that a lot of uh, girls are used to make guys uh, behave uh, from an early age uh, in school. For instance, if you have a guy that uh, you know talk too much, then you place him next to a girl, uh, and you're used to like having girls uh, taking the role of. Uh, being the grown-up or being the responsible or uh, be having that role and and that uh, makes guys scared to have uh, girls in their in their playing group because i mean nobody wants to uh, to to be looked after they just want to play their games and i mean the girls they also just want to play their games so i think that's uh, a big issue that grown-ups are creating from a really early age mm. Yeah, that's um, that's a great point. I, uh, I, yeah, I agree with that totally. Uh, thank you for answering those questions. <laughs> and then we have another one. I think this is for Andrea and Audrey. 
it's about game creation. And uh, it says, I'm in the process of making a game about a theme generally targeted to women, like fashion or cooking. But I'd like to make it gender neutral as to encourage people from any background to play it. Is it possible? How would you, Andrea or Audrey, go about um, tackling a traditionally feminine topic and making it accessible for everyone? Well, I think there's been examples already, uh, like Cooking Mama. Have you played mm. Cooking Mama? It's like men and women play Cooking Mama. Um, so you're going to say, yeah, cooking, cooking is the, the chefs are men and uh, the cooks are women, right? It's like, but so it's not, but I think it's possible. Yeah, um, I, I encourage you to uh, play test your game to see how you are going to talk to your different audiences, of course, but uh, I, um, I wouldn't be discouraged to try. I'm sure we can find more examples. You probably have them in mind better than me. Yeah, thank you. Um, we also have um, Overcooked, which is hilarious. And like most um, RPG games uh, are about getting the coolest gear possible. So I don't think a game about fashion necessarily have to be targeted to women. It could be targeted to anyone. Um, because, you know, people like to look good. <laughs> so it's, it's more about how, I guess, how you frame frame it, sort of. How you like advertise it and marketing and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, if, Andrea? Yeah, if I can just jump in quickly. Yeah, like <laughs> I think you can talk about any topic. It really just depends how you do it. Yeah. Like, uh, like play a lot of games that are already out there within the genre you, you, you want to create your game in and then kind of see what, uh, what could work, what couldn't work. And then a lot of play testing on, on different genders. And I'm sure you can do something that would... Uh, yeah, appeal to not only one one group. Yeah, thank you. I am. I agree. <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> um, uh, another question about uh, this is a good one. Uh, it's important that technologies and games are being designed by a diversity of skills, genders, backgrounds, and cultures. What about cultural diversity in games design? Do you see things progressing in the scene in general? No, uh, no takes on that. It's it's kind of, it's kind of a broad uh, and slightly difficult question because we have to know what they mean by cultural diversity first I think uh, but we see more and more especially in Norway we have uh, game developers who sort of um, take their cues from from like Norse mythology and old folk tales and and uh, Norwegian history and, and make games about that so that sort of um, a cultural thing uh, but I'm not sure if we see the same thing elsewhere in the world. Like uh, games about Indian mythology aren't that many, uh, or uh, Native American culture, or um, uh, stuff like that. Um, hopefully, things will progress in that scene in the future because we need diversity in all aspects. Um, at least that's my opinion. I can um, just chip in briefly. Uh, yeah. I wanted to mention, especially the North American queer indie game scene for, for that aspect. That's, that is, uh, of course, there are European developers, but I uh, just was mentioned Bonnie Ruberg's book, The Queer Games Avant Garde, uh, which is a very interesting study with queer developers in how they subvert both content and mechanics to play at different types of queer experiences, not just by representing sexuality, but doing something as part of the actual experience of, of being queer or having a queer identity, uh, which really experiments with a lot of genre conventions and is also worth uh, checking out uh, as part of that cultural diversity in uh, game design. Great. 
Thank you. I think uh, we'll have time for one last question. And it's about the recruitment process uh, for people who apply for jobs in the games industry. Uh, what do you think about the recruitment process? There is companies who say they follow diversity, uh, but they still ask your age, race, gender on the recruitment site when you submit your application. Has there been any changes to, to how people are being recruited into the video game industry? And have, are there any companies or publishers or developers that have actively done a good job at widening their uh, pool of recruits or applicants? and um, to encourage diversity in their workforce. Um, yeah, it's a good question. Um, and apparently it's very tough to answer. Well, I can, I can also mention we uh, we have Women in Games France, with the help of Women in Games UK, has just recently uh, written a guide on how to make your um, culture more diverse and a whole, I mean, in a game studio uh, or a game company. And the whole subject is on recruitment. And I think it's an ongoing process in, in all of the video game, company, video game companies, and it's improving slowly. Um, and it goes from, you know, writing the recruitment ads in an inclusive way to uh, hiring recruiters who are not uh, only men and who have a specific target uh, in their recruitment of uh, hiring diverse teams, to uh, choosing also the right language in the way you phrase the applications and, uh, and conveying the right company culture, to uh, going through uh, the right networks where the women are, which might not be exactly on the same Twitter or they might be somewhere else, so finding them and and to also doing the interview process, anonymizing the, the applications, removing the gender, the names and everything uh, on the resumes. So there's lots of steps to be taken there and they're all very good to be put in place. I don't know if any company in the video game industry does them all already, but uh, I know a lot of companies are using those techniques. Uh, Marke? Uh, thank you. Very shortly, this is not about cultural diversity, but I know that in Finland some companies have, in addition to what Bertrand already mentioned, they have also tried to write the uh, recruitment advertisements in a manner that you don't demand too many technical skills because obviously we know that a lot of the girls might not apply for a job if, if there are you need to know these and these and these programming languages and have this and this many years experience and and this applies to other industries as well that uh, women may be perhaps more shy to apply for jobs if they don't fill in all the all the uh, requirements so, so this is one way to, to actually make, make a wider address to, to a diverse, diverse pool of applicants and, and invite people to, to join. Uh, Lily, you had a comment? Uh, yeah, so uh, I've, I've seen both sides. Uh, a lot of the, the recent applications that I, when I applied for job, uh, have been uh, anonymized. So uh, taking away the, the name and the uh, and gender and so on. So I think that's a really good uh, process. Uh, I also got offered a job uh, a while ago as being a, a co-host to uh, to um, to an event. Uh, and then in the last second, uh, they told me that they wanted uh, a guy and a girl and the other, other host was, was already a girl. So, um, but the last time they did uh, this kind of uh, uh, event, they had two guys uh, being the, the hosts. And I think that's, uh, that speaks a bit because I've seen that before. It's like, it's okay to have two guys. Uh, talking about games or talking about a, a release, but you can't have two girls doing it uh, because then they're suddenly afraid to uh, to lose viewers or to lose uh, credibility. And also, the the girl that uh, were in this uh, um, in this event, she only got to uh, ask the social questions, and they gave all the tech questions to the guy, even though uh, their expertise were the other way around. Oh, wow. 
Yeah, I think um, uh, thank you uh, for for that uh, comment. Um, I think we answered that question pretty pretty well, and I think also that's all we have time for today. Uh, I see we're running a little bit over. Uh, that's good. We've had some excellent questions, um, uh, an excellent discussion. Um, I want to thank um, all of you for participating. It's been uh, been really, really fun and really interesting. Uh, so thank you so much. And um, hopefully we'll have another great discussion at some other time. And fingers crossed it won't be about uh, gender, but about something uh, cool. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.